the Godzilla anime trilogy is a failure. Even if by some miracle the third entry turns out to be a great film, the trilogy as a whole is still a failure by the law of majority rule since the first two thirds of it have faltered. Planet of the Monsters is okay but heavily flawed, and City on the Edge of Battle is a shameless retread of what preceded it compounded by wasted potential. At this point, I have no reason at all to believe that Planet Eater will manage to be any better than fine with a drawn out sigh, and given that this is Godzilla's first official foray into the anime realm, that's just a cry in shame. The failure of the second film, however, is what finally confirmed the thing I was dreading most about this trilogy. It just doesn't understand the monsters it's dealing with, or why people enjoy the monsters at all. Oh, there are plenty of other issues you can talk about, but looming over all of them is the lack of understanding for Godzilla. First and foremost, the movie has a strong desire to keep the monsters out of the action for as long as possible, and still render them mostly inactive when the action begins. I know, I know, you're going to say the same thing happened in the 2014 film, but at least there, Godzilla was doing stuff throughout the runtime of his own volition, even if he wasn't always doing it on screen. In the anime films, Godzilla doesn't really do anything until the final minutes of each entry, and even then, he proceeds to not do very much beyond just walk forward, be stopped from walking forward, then spam his finishing move at a crucial moment. Annie Goji has done less in the total 188 minutes of two films than Shin Godzilla did in the 120 minutes of one film, and Shin Godzilla hardly did anything himself. Look, I don't want to sound like the guy who's just here for the monsters, but the best monster movies are the ones that remember the monsters are characters too. Given that the humans and aliens are one-note cardboard cutouts, Anigoji is the last thing I have to get invested in, and he just feels like an obstacle that happens to walk and spit fire. He may as well be a tree for all that it matters. Speaking of which, that brings us to another issue. The movies are being different solely for the sake of being different, yet simultaneously not doing anything worthwhile with those differences. Anigoji is a plant. He is literally a giant vegetable that looks like a dinosaur for reasons that have never been elaborated on and likely never will. Why is he a plant? Some fans have theorized that it was so he could terraform Earth. After humanity fled, he buried himself underground and all the new life on the planet was spawned directly from him. Thanks to City on the Edge of Battle, this theory has been debunked. The new ecosystem of Earth evolved in response to Godzilla, but it is mere mimicry, not evolution direct from the source, meaning the same thing would have happened whether Godzilla was a plant or a reptile. Well, maybe his vegetative state is a metaphorical embodiment of the natural world's hostility towards mankind. Interesting theory, but the natural world in this movie is already hostile enough on its own, so why would we need Godzilla to represent it? The leaves can break steel for heaven's sake. If you can't even touch a plant without potentially slicing your fingers off, the presence of a giant monster is gravy. When the original Godzilla represented the atomic bomb, at least those bombs were a distant looming threat. They weren't as ubiquitous as the air you breathe or the grass on your front lawn. Since the environmental danger is already everywhere, Godzilla is thus rendered a gratuitous element in his own movie. This change was pointless. There is no reason whatsoever for Godzilla to be a plant. There's plenty of reason for him to be a dragon, as I've delved into elsewhere, but not a plant. And since it hasn't had any effect on his portrayal anyway, I have to ask, why did they even bother? Then you have the mishandling of Mechagodzilla. First of all, there's that butt-ugly design that even a Dadaist sculptor would sincerely refer to as a mistake. Let me demonstrate how truly awful this design is. Here we see super deformed or chibi versions of other Mechagodzillas. They are still recognizable as Mechagodzilla each time. Now here's a grub made of broken car parts. Except that's not a grub, it's an Mechagoji. Go ahead, tell me that doesn't look like a fat caterpillar. If that doesn't prove this thing is unrecognizable as, and thus utterly fails at the basic concept of being a robot Godzilla, then I don't know what else to say. 
Then again, harping on this pile of chrome junk too much is pointless, since it doesn't really factor into the movie anyway. After all, why would you want a giant robot that can move around, interact with its environment, and potentially express a personality when you can have a bunch of immobile, unthinking buildings instead? I've seen people trying to say that the idea of Mechagodzilla City is new and intriguing, but I strongly disagree. In fact, if you're one of the people who likes how these movies are being different for different sake, I'd be more surprised if Mechagodzilla City didn't disappoint you, because it's not that new. The idea of seeing a kaiju march through a city as various armaments fire upon him has happened in almost every giant monster movie ever, and the way it plays out here is exactly the same as Planet of the Monsters, just in an urban setting. All this new movie does differently from past examples is combine the armaments and the buildings together and substitute planes with tiny mechs. Heck, even weaponized buildings aren't that new. Remember the electrical towers in Mothra vs. Godzilla way back in 1964? I rest my case. Now, there was a way they could have made this concept truly unique. Since this city was grown from the total Prius that once sat atop Mechagodzilla's neck, there was potential for Mechagodzilla City to be a character in its own right. It could have had an artificial intelligence in charge of everything, and since it had been developing unsupervised for 20,000 years, perhaps there might have been some uncertainty about how reliable it is. Being inside one of these structures is to be in the literal belly of the beast, which is not the most comfortable place to be. What if it pulls a HAL 9000 and starts acting on its own? What if the spread of nanometal isn't part of the plan to defeat Godzilla, but an unforeseen consequence of Frankenstein's science? What if Godzilla actually enters the city instead of a pit on the perimeter, and the buildings are constantly coming to life and attacking him from all sides, overwhelming him and creating a real sense that he might lose? That is something we've never seen before, and it might have made up for any other misgivings I have about the second entry. But it doesn't happen. Mechagodzilla City is just a series of inanimate objects being controlled by the Bill Saluto, and it is to them all the personality and danger are assigned. And, by the way, the themes discussed by them were handled much better in series like Helsing, Alien 9, and Ghost in the Shell. For all that it matters, Mechagodzilla City is just a glorified factory. You could remove any connection to Mechagodzilla from the script and not lose anything vital. Ergo, this change is also pointless. Then you have the mishandling of literally every other monster Toho has by relegating them all to a prologue that doesn't even last five minutes and ultimately has no impact on the story. I mean it, the whole kaiju apocalypse serves no narrative point at all. You can drop it and have Godzilla be the only monster whose rampage around the world is so devastating that mankind must flee, and nothing plot-wise would change. The prologue is an afterthought, and thus should not have been included. Then again, maybe the sidelining of the other monsters was a blessing in disguise, since it prevented the anime team from screwing them up. Oh wait, Rodan's skeleton is just that of a perfectly normal Pteranodon. Never mind, they still found a way to blow it. At the rate things are going, I'm expecting King Ghidorah to be a giant space cloud and Mothra to be a taco with wings if she even bothers to show up. Whatever changes are made, I guarantee you they won't amount to Jack Squad either. Quick aside, I didn't get chills when Metpheus named Ghidorah because I was honestly expecting it. Even if I hadn't been covering news, I would have been expecting it. A terrifying enemy from space, you say? Who else could it possibly be other than Ghidorah? My only thought upon hearing this was to wonder how they'll justify him showing up. Presumably, he's on the Exif's planet millions of light years away with no knowledge of what's happening on Earth, no way to find out, no reason to care, and no way to get there in a reasonable amount of time. Mark my words, Ghidorah's entrance to the plot in Planet Eater will be the epitome of contrivance, if it's explained at all, and he probably won't even fight Godzilla. Well, why should I believe that he will? I was expected to believe Godzilla would fight Mechagodzilla in this movie, and that didn't happen. If Godzilla and Ghidorah do fight, it probably won't even last three minutes, and most of the focus will likely be on the cardboard cutouts executing the same plan as before, only this time trying to kill two monsters instead of one. I've said it a thousand times before, and I'll continue to say it until it sinks in. Different is not synonymous with good. Shin Godzilla is an example of being too different and leaning hard into it. 
but the anime trilogy is an example of being too different, yet simultaneously afraid to be different. Let me explain by way of a tangent. There's been a vocal push to cast Idris Elba as James Bond. That might be cool to see, not because of some diversity quota nonsense, but because Idris Elba is a great actor and would probably do a good job as the ultimate British spy. I have an idea though. Let's take the change even further. In my vision, the new James Bond is a native Jamaican, a practicing Buddhist who has sworn off violence, dresses in casual vacation clothes, and just for the heck of it, let's also make him pansexual. What, does that not sound like James Bond to you? Tough! I'm going to make a James Bond movie with this character, only once the plot kicks in, he's going to put on a suit, be completely loyal to the crown, kill his enemies in creative ways, and exclusively have relations with women. So why did I bother making all of those changes if none of them are going to affect the film? Up yours, that's why. I'm an artist, and I'm going to do whatever the heck I want. If you have problems with that, you're not a real fan, but I'll happily take your money anyway. Now do you get what I'm talking about? The bottom line is that the Godzilla anime trilogy just doesn't get Godzilla. It went ahead and made a bunch of unnecessary changes, then did nothing with them, thus rendering the monsters as hollow shells. Between this, Shin Godzilla, and those god-awful Attack on Titan movies, I have to say that I no longer believe the current staff at Toho knows how to make kaiju films. Remember folks, Toho is not a singular unchanging entity. It's a conglomerate of multiple entities in constant flux, and right now the entities comprising the whole have been making mistake after mistake. I don't want more kaiju movies just to have them. I want quality kaiju movies because quality is what keeps genres alive, and I've currently been getting those from the west more often than from the east. Sorry folks, but I don't trust the current Toho crew with Godzilla anymore. Now, a new franchise is being planned, so they have a chance to earn my trust back, but they've got a long way to go before they get it. Until I see some evidence that they've pulled their heads out of their butts and remember what made the series work in the first place, I'll be sticking with the American movies. So long as they don't screw up either, that is.